to be with all of you. Grace and peace here. Uh, it's nice to be here and have a time of, of singing and, and hearing from the Word. I don't remember exactly what year this was. I, it was somewhere around the year 2000, plus or minus. And I was at a conference uh, that was uh, a Pentecostal conference. So I was raised in charismatic churches. So from the time I was born onward, we went to charismatic churches, and this happened to be a Pentecostal conference. So those tend to be uh, very different from the kinds of conferences that probably most of you are accustomed to. Uh, there's a lot of, of worship. There's a lot of exuberance. There's a lot of, of uh, emphasis on healing, things like that. And I was at this conference with a, a friend of mine who was a person who I'd known from when he was fairly young, as a maybe 10-year-old, something like that. And this young man was, I would call him somewhat of a punk. He, was, he had a really bad attitude, and he, he was the type of person who, if you asked a question, he would always give you like a snarky, smart aleck answer. And, and that's not who I am. Like most of you know, I'm not that like constant jokester type. But for him, that was just his, his way of talking. Generally was not a very respectful person. Like I said, pretty, pretty snarky, pretty, for me at least, unpleasant to be with. But um, I was friends with his family. I knew several of his family members, and, and uh, we were at this conference together. So here we were at this conference, and the sermon was given. It was, a, it was an OK sermon. And they had a time at the end where they were going to worship, Pentecostal style, of course. And as they were, as they were beginning the worship, the, the, the preacher up top said, if anybody would like to come down and receive prayer while we worship, I will, um, I'll pray for people. And much to my surprise, this young man who was sitting right next to me, we were kind of near the, the middle back, says, I'm going to go up. And I thought, like, whoa. You go up for prayer? Like, what's going on? So he goes up, and, and I was looking at the clock because we had to be somewhere else at a different time. So they have the worship, and I'm sitting there waiting for him because we're going to go together. And, and uh, the, the, the service concludes. He comes up to me, and I'm like, hey, let's go. Let's go. we got to get going. And I stopped in my tracks when I looked at his face, because it's the closest I've ever seen to, you know how it talked about Moses glowing after he comes down on the mountain? This is the only time in my life where I think I've ever seen somebody glow. And he had this glow, and he said, I can't, I just met Jesus. I was like, what do you mean, I'm, you just met Jesus? He's like, I met Jesus. And again, he's born and raised in the church. We've known each other for a long time, gone to lots of church meetings together. And so he tells me the story of what happens. I'm not going to go into all that now, but he had a, a very, very transformative experience when he was up there at this, in this prayer slash worship service. And overnight, like within, actually from that one point forward, he was a totally different person, totally different person. And I, ha I don't think I've ever seen in my life somebody do that degree of a 180 in such a short period of time. It made a huge impact on me. Partly because, you know, we talk a lot in Christian circles about change and about the power of God and discipleship and transformation and all these things, but sometimes it's kind of hard to see, <laughs> and sometimes we, we long to see these, like, amazing examples of transformation, but that happened to be one. When, when you see the power of God change a person like that, it, it changes your world. This young man went on to become a, a person who, we, we joke and we used to call him a pastor. He's not actually ordained or anything like that. But he just couldn't stop talking about God to this day. That's all he talks about is God. And not only that, but he's one of these people that when he talks, everybody gets really quiet because something deep is going to come out of his mouth and something very profound. In fact, I like, I like to listen to his, his sermons. Last night, my wife was quoting from him. And uh, I've used a lot of his material, and I'm just like, and he doesn't read anything, like doesn't read commentaries, he just reads his Bible. And I'm like, where does this kid get this stuff? It's just amazing, the, the gravitas and the transformation that he had. 
what happened with him is he walked through a portal of change. He walked through a, an amazing experience, and that experience was one of worship. There's something about worship where heaven and earth can, can meet. They can interlock in these ways that we can't even really understand and cause change that just talking about things, thinking good thoughts, reading books, etc., can't really do. I'm going to say, and I'm going to walk through here, some principles that I've learned over the years about change, particularly through worship. And I want to say, if you are personally in a situation where you're feeling a desire for change, a desire for something fresh in your life, or you have a child or a loved one that you want to see change, I want to consider this evening, how we can open the biblical door of worship, which I'm going to contend is one of the main ways that God would have us change supernaturally. Okay, so I'm actually going to pray again, and we'll, we'll begin our message. Father in heaven, I pray that as we dive into this subject of worship and what it is biblically, that you would open our eyes to see you to see you as the living God, the God who right now is surrounded by the cherubim and the 24 elders and a scene so breathtaking, if we were to experience it, surely we wouldn't, wouldn't even be able to speak. I pray we would understand what you have for us in this storehouse, that we may be opened to not man-made change, but to divine change the change that Jesus promises when he says that he's going to make us new. And it's in his name we pray, amen. All right, I, I have um, mentioned this, I think, twice before at a citywide. I sometimes call it the four ceilings uh, or four principles here of effectiveness by Jack Taylor. I'm going to give you the first one, and hopefully... So people can remember the other, the other three, because this is the third time. But I think about this all the time. It's something that I use frequently in my own spiritual life here. So the first principle is the church's effectiveness cannot rise above its corporate prayer life. Okay, you'll see where I'm going with this and how to tie this to worship in a sec. But the first principle is the church's effectiveness cannot rise above its corporate prayer life. What's the next one? And I know there's people here who have heard me preach on this because... Very good. Thank you. Good job, Brian. So the way that Jack Taylor phrases it is he says, no church's corporate prayer life will be greater than the prayer lives of its constituents. Third one. Anybody remember? Pretty close, pretty close. Hey, I like, I like that you're looking up notes there, Brother Jeff. That's good. Uh, no believer's spiritual life will rise above his or her prayer life. Okay, and then the final principle is no believer's prayer life will rise to stay above the level of his or her personal, regular, daily time of worship with God. Okay, so these four ceilings, these four limits are gold. I'm telling you, they're absolute gold. I'll, I'll simplify it slightly, and you should... Write it down, memorize it, put it in your journal because it really is valuable. So the church's life is limited. There's a ceiling that a church can never crack through, and that is the level of its corporate prayer life. But then there's another ceiling, which is that the church's corporate life is limited by the prayer lives of its members. In other words, if everybody has a cold life individually, the corporate prayer life isn't going to be anything remarkable. The third ceiling is that your personal Spiritual life will not rise above your prayer life. That's the third ceiling. And then the fourth ceiling is no believer's prayer life will rise to stay above to the level of his or her personal, regular, daily time of worship with God. Okay, so your prayer life is actually bounded by your worship life. Okay, so this is so wise. There's so much uh, gold in those four limits those four principles here that I want us to meditate on here. So, so basically, this, these set of principles, these set of ceilings or limits tell us that 
if we expect to make it as an individual, as a church, then what do we need? We need to have a personal, regular, daily time of worship with God. Meaningful, heartfelt, sacrificial. If we don't, we will live lives of unfruitfulness and frustration. Those of you who use the Core Discipleship Journal know the very first box that is in the upper section there is time and worship, and that is motivated by this principle here. So biblically speaking, this is all throughout Scripture, that, that this notion that worship is the portal of change. I'm going to read one example of this. It's, it's one of, of a few that I really like, but in the interest of time, I'll only read one. It's from 1 Samuel chapter 3, and it's right after Samuel finds Saul, who at this point is a no-name, and he anoints him. He puts oil on his head. He pours oil over his head. And in verses 5 to 6, listen to what Samuel says. He says, And there, as soon as you come to the city, you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, and lyre before them, prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Okay, so he says, Samuel tells Saul, there's going to be this group of people, this group of prophets that come down, and they're going to have a harp and tambourine and flutes, and they're going to be prophesying. Now, I've spoken about this before, but hopefully everybody remembers this. The original, earliest uses of the verb prophesy in the Hebrew Bible mean to worship. Okay, so this is a very confusing concept, but the first several times that the, the verb uh, for, for prophesying is used, it's, it's to worship. And so here they're going to be worshiping. And then it says, what does Saul, uh, Samuel say? The Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, and you will prophesy with them, you will worship with them, and be turned into another man. And you read the rest of that story, that happens. This group of people come going down the hill, and he joins them, and and people are just blown away. They're like, what what just happened to this character Saul? There's another story which we won't read in 1 Samuel 19. This is kind of after Saul goes crazy, and he loses his his wits, and his godliness, and he's out in the pursuit of David, and there's another session of prophesying, and he sends this company of people to, like, capture David, and they get so caught up in this spirit of worship, they they can't capture David, and they end up prophesying, they end up worshiping, and he sends another one, same thing happens, and then Saul himself goes, and he ends up getting caught up in this, and there's, like, this force field that's around this, this exuberant worship, this prophesying that seems to, to arrest people. It's a very, very powerful engine of change. Uh, For those who are at Oakland Street, I already signed up to do a midweek where we're going to do a deeper dive on how to lead children into a a more vibrant worship life. I'm excited for that. Uh, You can see the date on the online spreadsheet. So so this here is as, as another example of something like the story I told you before at the beginning where somebody just goes, boom, just different person after this experience of worshiping, prophesying here, as, as it says, you'll become another man, another person, another human. So my first point is that worship is the engine of change. Worship is the engine of change or the door of change. Biblically speaking, again, you can try to, to grit yourself into change. You can try to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can try to say, I'm going to double down on this, on this resolution it's January, so people have just made New Year's resolutions. You can, you can try those things, and they may or may not work. Uh, don't, I'm not opposed to them. But if you want to be changed into another man, another woman, another human being, this is the way that Scripture describes it. All right, my next point is that worship is a bigger category than singing. Worship is a bigger category than singing. We, we tend to conflate worship and singing, and it's not, it's not unreasonable, but it's not quite accurate. I, I heard a, a definition, this, this was to me humorous, where somebody proposed the definition that worship music was slow music and praise music was fast music. And I thought, that's your definition of worship versus praise. Worship is like going slow, singing a hymn, and praise is like the upbeat, like clapping type song. I'm like, what is that? Um, Not a good definition, not a biblical definition there. 
it's not the easiest word to define. Uh, you can do a study from the, the Hebrew and Greek words there. I think what's probably as helpful is to just look at what are the words that are traveling together with worship. Because it gives you a sense of at least correspondence or parallel structure. So these are some of the words that are very, very common with, that, that travel together with worship. They run in parallel with worship. So uh, serve may be the most common. Serve is very common. Bless, sing, praise, confess, bow down, sacrifice, seek. Those are some of the, some of the words that tend to run together with worship. Serve, bless, sing, praise, confess, bow down, sacrifice, and seek. If you look up in the ESV or New King James or one of those Bibles, what's the very first time that the word worship is used in the Bible? Uh, it's used in Genesis chapter 22. That's the story of where Abraham is told that he needs to offer his son Isaac on the altar. And I'll read to you what Genesis 22 says, this is verses three to five. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So the lad and I will go yonder and worship. He probably doesn't mean just we're going to go sing some songs together and come back. He's talking about sacrifice here, right? Putting Isaac on that altar. So very interesting. Uh, someone pointed this out. I think this is a great observation. In the beginning of this, verse 3, Abraham rose early in the morning to do this. Blows, blows me away. Think about that. You were told to offer your beloved son on the altar. And instead of deferring, procrastinating, hemming and hawing, he gets up early in the morning to go do that. What a, what a picture that is. We see throughout the Bible that worship to God, authentic worship to God, often happens early in the morning. Uh, that's a, an interesting observation there. So, so in this instance of worship, it's clearly very sacrificial, as about as sacrificial as they come. But as I said, the word is used in a much broader sense than merely singing. This is a good example. In Romans 12, a very famous passage, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That was the ESV. The New King James actually translates it as service there instead of worship, but they're very close. And, and here, again, sacrifice is prominent in this understanding of worship, except we're presenting ourselves. So if it's the case that Abraham offering his son Isaac is an example of worship, what might be a better definition than merely singing? Okay, it definitely includes singing, for sure. But I'm going to propose here, I made this up, so maybe this can be improved, but a definition that I came up with for worship is acts of heartfelt and sacrificial devotion to God according to his word, okay? Acts of heartfelt and sacrificial devotion to God according to his word. So heartfelt, this isn't something you're just going through the motions about. It's sacrificial. It costs you something. Uh, and it's in accord with, with God's truth. There's a lot of people who do things that are very heartfelt, you know, if, if have you ever seen like these pictures of people flagellating themselves with like iron chains in, in Iran and they're like their backs are bleeding and whoa, you just think of that. Wow, that's that's an intense devotion to your God, but that's not in accordance to the scriptures. So if this is an accurate definition, I think worship suddenly includes more than just singing. It can include prayer, it can include confession, it can even include serving the body. And in fact, in Romans 12, right after he says what he says there, he launches into the discussion of the body and how different people can serve each other in different ways. 
But there is a good reason why music and singing are probably what we think about most readily when we think of worship. I'll read you a quote here that captures this well. Blaise Pascal observed that the people who have the greatest influence in shaping the hearts and minds of any generation are not the folks who write the laws, but those who write the songs. Plato, the Greek philosopher, observed, musical training is a more potent instrument than any other because rhythm and harmony find their way into the inward places of the soul on which they mightily fasten. Okay, so what's basically uh, Plato and Pascal saying? that there's something about our songs that sticks. It, it goes deep. You know, they, they tend to stick to the heart. They, he says the, it, it goes to the inward places of the soul on which they mightily fasten. And so if the goal is to have this heartfelt expression of devotion, then, hey, songs are a great tool for that. I have said this many times that if we correctly use technology. People like to complain about technology, but there are two uses of technology that I think ought to be the devil's undoing, which are the right use of, of sermons and being able to share sermons, to be able to listen to the word of God, and it expounded all over uh, the world very ably and, and, and in a way to inspire us and help us, and then also the use of, of uh, worship singing. Uh, if we were to use those two well, man, I think we could just hit it out of the park as a, as a church. Okay, so, so here in my second point, I said worship is bigger than just singing. It's a bigger category than just singing. My third point is that worship has requirements. Worship has requirements. Now, I gave you before some of the verbs that travel together with worship. Serve, sing, praise, bless, confess, sacrifice. It gives us a feel for the word, but there is an, there's an adjective that travels with worship very closely. See if you can think of what it is. I won't ask you to say it out loud. Can you think of what the adjective is that goes with worship? There's a, there's a big one, and that one is acceptable. Acceptable is the word that, the adjective that often goes with worship. So we actually heard that in Romans 12, right, which is your acceptable worship. And in the Old Testament, when people were to offer a sacrifice, there was always this question, is God going to accept my sacrifice? They had this concept that a sacrifice might be rejected or it might be accepted. And in fact, very early on, we all know the story of Abel and Cain and how one person's sacrifice was accepted and the other person's was not. And that, of course, becomes the basis of, of murder. Uh, this was a point of anxiety. In Leviticus 10, there's that famous story of Nadab and Abihu who offer up worship. They, it says unauthorized fire or strange fire, and they're killed because they don't offer rightly to God. Saul himself loses the kingdom in 1 Samuel 13 because he offers an unlawful sacrifice. So there was always this question of, is my sacrifice going to be accepted? Is it going to be uh, accepted by God, or is it going to be rejected? And so this, this notion of sacrifice that was pleasing to God versus a self-styled type of, of worship was looming large in the Old Testament mind. And part of this is because there were very clear requirements that were put onto worship. Time and time again, the prophets tell the people in the Old Testament things like, I hate your worship. I hate your sacrifices. It's a stench to me. Why are you doing this? Because you're treating each other poorly. There's no justice in your society. Just quit. What, do you, what is all this about? Unless those entry requirements are met, a basic level of repentance and devotion to God, the worship itself becomes meaningless. Another example of this is Psalm 24, a famous psalm that says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place, the tabernacle or the temple? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Another psalm says it well, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Other translations render that, worship the Lord in holy array or holy garments. And the idea is that you can't 
Just like you can't go to a wedding without, without the right clothing, you can't worship God rightly unless you are clothed, unless you are wrapped in holiness. Otherwise, it becomes a stench before God. There's another requirement, of course, which is that the, the, the contents of what is offered should be something that is sacrificial. It should be special. It should be something that costs you something. One of the most famous passages on this point is from Malachi 1, where it says in verse 8, when you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious with us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show any favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Further down, you bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or is sick, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. So he says, like, there's no way you would bring this lousy animal if you were a dinner guest at a governor. But here I am, the great king. How are you doing? An analog for us today might be, hey, you make your calendar appointments. Maybe you use Google Calendar or some other system. Hey, you make your calendar appointments. You show up at class on time. You, you show the... What about your time with me? Where's that? How, how, would, how, would God, uh, how would we answer if God were to ask that question? So the requirements for worship are this basic level of holiness and something that costs us something, something that is sacrificial. I, I want to challenge everyone here in a fresh way to have a daily time of worship with God prayer with God, and have that be truly non-negotiable, something where you can say with a clean conscience, this is pleasing to God because I'm meeting this standard of holiness, and it costs me something. If you're making your other appointments, if you're making other obligations, can we not do that? As God would say, for I'm a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Uh, I, uh, I, I love talking to people about how to make Disciplines like this, a regular part of their life. And if it's not, it will, it will be something that will make our worship uh, not acceptable. Because, you know, it's funny. We sing songs like, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. You know, a song like that is, is kind of a joke if we're not actually doing it in our own lives, right? We can sing it here really nice and have the melody be very beautiful. But are we actually seeking first the kingdom of God even in our own lives? In short, we need a cleansing of the modern temple, just as Jesus was fed up with the busyness and the commerce of the first century temple, could we say that we have become too busy in our world today for acceptable worship? It is very easy for our lives to be full of, quote, Christian activities. You can be ending world poverty. You can be trying to bring peace to the Middle East and yet have your life fundamentally be something that is not worshipful. You can be doing seemingly great things for God, but not actually with God. I'll also say this is a surefire recipe for burnout. It is a surefire recipe for burnout. What your soul needs, what my soul needs, is open, restful, unhurried spaces, worshiping God. That is the best fuel for the journey. When we do that, we can arise and say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Uh, I, I, I will promise you that, and I have, I have proven those promises in my own life many times and have seen again and again God's faithfulness in that. Okay, my next point is that worship is to be in spirit and in truth. So the, the most times, in the New Testament at least, that the word worship is used, there's a cluster that occurs in, the, in John 4, that story of Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman. And it's used about 10 times, the word worship, proskuneo, is used there uh, very frequently. And I'll read to you from one of the more famous parts of this dialogue, where it says, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming where neither on this mountain, 
Nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him, he must, or those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Okay, so there's this dialogue here with this Samaritan woman, and there was, of course, a debate about where was the true location of worship. Was it in the Mount Gerizim area of Samaria, or was it in, in Jerusalem, in Judea? And Jesus says, you know what? Something's coming, an hour's coming, where neither of these places is going to be where you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, so... You Samaritans worship what you do not know. And this is what he means by saying you should worship in truth, right? So she's worshiping in ignorance. They, the Samaritans had pieces missing of their theology. And she was saying, uh, Jesus was telling her, rather, you Samaritans worship what you don't know. You're not worshiping God in truth. Maybe you're worshiping him in a heartfelt manner, but you're not doing it in truth. He's saying the Jews at least have accurate truth about being in, about the, the place of worship being in Jerusalem. But, he says in verse 23, the hour is coming and is now here where the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Okay, so let's, let's pause for a moment here. So a lot of people miss this and don't fully appreciate the significance of what Jesus is saying here. He doesn't say, well, worship God in spirit and truth. He says, worship the Father in spirit and truth. And there's a huge significance to that, which is that whenever we see the Father anywhere in the New Testament, the first thing we should think is the Father has the Son, and the Son is, of course, Jesus. We sometimes get forgetful of this point, that what Jesus was bringing was a revelation of the Father and the Son. And when Jesus says things like in John 14, 20, uh, John 14, 6, no one can come to the Father except through me, he's talking about the fact that he's brought a revelation of the Father and the Son. And so this is why it is impossible to worship God rightly apart from an understanding of the Father and the Son. The only access we have in true worship to the Father is through the Son. This is a deeply Trinitarian passage that he is referencing here. In, in uh, verse 22, he says, you worship what you don't know. Basically, he's saying, you Samaritans have zeal without knowledge. Now, he is critical of the Jews and other places, no doubt. He has, um, he has places where he says hard things to them. He says in Mark chapter 7, verse 6, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So maybe the Jews had more truth, but were they worshiping the Father in the Spirit? No, they weren't. They were saying the right things, but their heart was far from God. So you can see here how the Samaritans may be worshiping God, not necessarily the Father, in spirit, but not in truth. You have over here the Jews who may have worshipped God, not necessarily the Father, in in truth, but not in spirit. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to bring them together. I want there to be the true worship of the Father, the Father of the Son, the Father of Jesus, and being united in spirit and in truth. Now, I want to say a little bit more about the spirit here. Uh, This is a, a famous passage, again, Psalm 51, David's famous penitential psalm where he talks about the spirit that God wants in worship. And he says, O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So what is the kind of spirit that God is looking for when it talks about worshiping him in spirit? It is a broken and a contrite spirit. That's what he is is looking for here. Okay, my final point is that our singing 
and I even mean here, reflects the authenticity of our worship. Our singing reflects the authenticity of our worship. One of the, the pictures that we learn from the book of Revelation, one of the, the truths that we learn in Revelation, is that it seems like heaven's primary interest is in worshiping God. When, God, when, when John is taken to, to heaven, it, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of people who are giving tours of different peripheral areas and checking out mansions that are being built. Everybody is so enthralled by the presence of God right smack in the middle of it that they're just caught up in this thunderous roar of, of pro- proclaiming praise to God. Revelation 5 is this tremendous scene of worship where people are falling on their faces and the throngs are shouting, holy, holy, holy. I, I long to be in places where that is the heart posture and it comes out in our voices. When, when we have the right picture of God in our mind, if we set our minds on that scene of heaven, we don't um, mumble, we don't casually declare things, we, we roar uh, praises to, to God's name here. This is where we have often missed things because we think like, oh, the Old Testament, they had it like, they had really high standards back then and yeah, yeah, they could have like gotten killed like Nadab and Abihu or lost the kingship or something like that. But thankfully, because of grace, we have it so much easier. I'm going to read to you first a quote from, from uh, DJ Mooney. This was, I was doing a study on Leviticus a while ago, and he put it really well. He says this, Modern worship is often characterized by ethos, talent, polish, and celebration over an assumed love provided by God to his darling worshipers. In sharp contrast, worship in Leviticus is marked by danger, expulsion, personal and corporate ethics, burning flesh, dried blood, sin, impurity, death, and a marked distinction between Israel and their holy Redeemer God. I love that quote because it's this beautiful contrast of how today a lot of us think of pick the band uh, pick the online channel, and there's talent, there's polish, there's some, there's some, uh, there's some feel goods in that. There's, there's this proclamation of an assumed love by God over His darling worshipers. That's not the the sense that we get from from the Old Testament. Now, a lot of people think like, oh yeah, yeah, fit, but just relax here. This is we're under grace. Don't you know that? It's so interesting though how. The author of Hebrews, at least, says the stakes are higher now. And the, the level of reverence and awe and, and just like our minds being blown by the greatness of God in a posture of holiness ought to be even sharper. This is, this is the, the last scripture that I'm going to read here. It's from Hebrews 12. Starting in verse 18, he says, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire, and darkness, and gloom, and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and a voice whose words may the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of the things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship, there's that word again, with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. 
So put that in common, simple English. He says, back in the Old Testament, people were so afraid to approach Mount Zion. There was like all these orders, and people were like, oh, man, Moses, we can't even go there. Like, just talk to God for us, and we'll stay out of that, that terrifying sight. And he says, we're approaching a more fearful, a more awesome sight. Not Mount Sinai, but Mount Zion. To the city of the living God, to innumerable angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn that are enrolled in heaven, to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. I, I don't think that New Testament worship looks anything like a hands in the pocket, fold your hands type song, uh, type posture in worship. It's very easy for us to rattle through some hymns. But let me ask you, we just spent some time singing, but did we worship? Did we, in our preceding time of, of coming before God, were we engaged in heartfelt, sacrificial worship? It's supposed to be sacrificial, not casual. I also sometimes think that, that there's a, one of the best pictures of worship is the scene where the woman comes to Jesus and, and she pours the, the perfume on him and she, she weeps over him and she, she, she dries Jesus' feet with her hair. It's a beautiful scene. And people are just so offended and like, ah, oh, what's this woman doing? And look at all the waste and all that. And what, what Jesus says is he says, he who is forgiven the little loves the little. Might we say that he who worships little loves little, or he who worships casually, or she who worships casually loves little, because we have such, a, such a, an inadequate sense of our own deficiency. I'm going to read one final quote before I close, but I just want to review here. I talked about how worship is the engine of change. If you want to experience supernatural change, this is the way to do it. This is the path forward into supernatural change. There's a, uh, there's, my family and I, we've been going through 2nd uh, Corinthians, and it talks about how we can change. And does anybody know what, what it says in 2 Corinthians early about how to become more like Jesus? It's in 2 Corinthians 3. It says, with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. There's something about beholding the Lord that brings change. Okay, so we want to remember that worship is the engine of change. This is how we can supernaturally become new people. This is how other people that we can bring into the church can, can supernaturally change. I talked about how worship is a bigger category than singing. It certainly includes singing, but it's a bigger category. That worship has requirements, requirements of holiness, requirements of sacrifice. And I challenge you to make this a non-negotiable part of your life. And I mean non-negotiable. I want to I hear stories of people who can say, I've gone for hundreds, thousands of days without ever missing my daily time of worship. Because that's my ceiling. That's my ceiling that's going to determine the quality of my prayer life. If your prayer life is humdrum, I will, I will wager that your worship life is humdrum. I will, I, I think it's probably very, very likely. Uh, I talked about how worship has those requirements of sacrifice, of holiness. Uh, we talked about how worship is to be in spirit and in truth, and how our singing is a reflection of the authenticity of our worship. I'm going to close with a quote from one of my favorite writers, Soren Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard is always observant, always perceptive, seems to have fresh insights here. And... I want, to listen, I want us to listen to his challenge here. It's a short quote. He says, People have the idea that the preacher is an actor on a stage, and they are the critics, blaming or praising him. Very common. What they don't know, Kierkegaard says, is that they are the actors on the stage. He is merely the prompter standing in the wings, reminding them of their lost lines. Who is the audience, I ask you? Are you the audience? I'm reminding you of your lost lines tonight. So you're the actors here on this, on this stage. 
Who's the audience? The audience is, of course, God himself. It is not you by any, any stretch of the imagination. I want us to recover this in a, in a way that we have not before. Um, Brother Zach, are you going to be closing us in, in worship? Unless the original one will be. Okay. No, you're good. You can go ahead. Okay. So I think we're going we're gonna to have Brother Zach lead us in a, a final time of worship. But let's do it with a heartfelt, sacrificial posture. I loved how you invited us to lift holy hands before. That was beautiful. It's a very biblical concept. Especially if you're worried about other people and how you look, you haven't begun to touch the heart of worship there. That's um, that's something which, again, will challenge you to. So I'm going to close this here in prayer. And then, Brother Zach, you can come up and uh, close this out with some songs. Father, would you please forgive us for missing the goal of our lives? The goal of our lives ought to be to render to you the worship that is due your name. To do so in a sacrificial manner wherein we can find our refreshment, our life, our joy, and the transformation that we long to experience. Father, I pray for every person here who's about to to sing who's about to worship, that this would be a heartfelt, genuine time of of confession, of praise, of gratitude. May this be something that is not the limit on our life. May it be something that's not the limit or the lid on our spiritual life, but may it be something that takes us higher and pushes us higher to more fervent prayer, to deeper times of connection with you. And may that flow upward into our our corporate lives of, of prayer that we as a people may be effective. Thank you, Father, that you are the Father of the Son, Jesus, that you have made a way of access through him. Thank you that though people may disappoint and may others may let us down, you are the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Your holiness is beyond our understanding. You are so other. You you are the one who, to you, light years is like a millimeter. We praise you for your greatness, for your power, for your love, and may we bask in that as we seek to, to sing sacrificially in a heartfelt way, and may we bring the glory to your son, Jesus.